great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So Justice, God of Jacob, you use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation, and all your people sing along. So moment and greet someone next to you this morning and welcome them here. Welcome. It's good to see you today. Glad to be together to worship this morning. We want to highlight a few things as we start our time of worship together. First, if you're a guest with us, uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to see one of the ushers in the back and they'll help you out uh, during the service. We have nursery care, cry room, uh, junior church available. There's a um, sensory friendly room and just the beginning of the hallway there if you have need of that. Uh, and if you would, uh, there's a card in the pew pocket in front of you. If you'd like to know more information about the church, you can fill that out, put it in the offering plate when it comes by later. And then uh, also you can use the other side of that card, and then we can use that for prayer concerns. We'd love to be praying for you uh, as a staff this week. A couple things we want to highlight, and you can find all these things in your bulletin, so take a look at that later on. But we want to make sure that you're aware of a couple things. First, the Senior Adult Thanksgiving Feast and Hymn Sing is November 7th, and that's at 11 a.m., and you can sign up for that at the Welcome Center or call the church office. Also, Operation Christmas Child, um, we're still doing the, the weekly item, uh, collection item. Uh, this week is socks or gloves. Um, again, you can find details about that at the Welcome Center also. So go to the Welcome Center and find more information about what to bring each week for Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. 
And then the congregational budget meeting is Monday, November 14th at 7 o'clock. Um, budgets w are available at the Welcome Center, so you can grab one there, take a look at before you come to the meeting. Uh, so please be aware of that. Um, and then uh, I have to make one correction. Um, the student ministry winter retreats uh, box, um, I, uh, yep, do, did what I do. I did an oops. Um, the, the weekends are flip-flopped. Um, I had the wrong wrong weekends. That'll be fixed for next week. The junior high retreat is February 10th through the 12th. The senior high retreat is February 17th to the 20th. Um, so we'll make make the change on, on those dates. That'll be corrected. But uh, looking forward to that. It sounds like a long way off, but it's coming very quickly, and we are beginning to prepare for those things now. Uh, so please uh, mark your calendars for that for junior and senior high students. Uh, you can mark the correct dates. Um, and then also, if you hadn't heard um, yet, we want to be praying uh, today, and we'll be praying this week for the Wilson family as uh, uh, Bill Wilson Sr. passed away uh, this past week, went home to be with the Lord. Um, so we're going to be praying for them, praying for Danny and Judy and the family, and just grateful for them and with them uh, that uh, he was a godly man, uh, and he's with his Savior now, and uh, just a heritage of, of faith and trusting him. So we'll be praying for them, and the visitation is 6 p.m. this Tuesday, and there will be a service right here at 7 o'clock on Tuesday. Um, so please, if you can make it out to that, I'm sure the family would appreciate your support that way. Well, if you would stand, and we will do the scripture of the week together, uh, and you can use your bulletin. Yep, grab your bulletin for that. The scripture is at the very bottom of the bulletin under the boxes on the inside right here. It is Galatians 3, verse 28. I hear papers moving. We'll say this together. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 28. Heavenly Father, we are united today. We're, we're together in this place today not separated by um, distinction, but Lord, we are together united under the Lordship of Jesus, uh, united under the, the fact that we are saved uh, by his grace alone, uh, by faith. And Father, we pray that this morning as we come together as, as one body, uh, as the church family, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, that we would worship you as you deserve to be worshiped because of who you are. God, we commit this time to you. We pray that we would be unified um, in proclaiming the name of Jesus above any other name. We love you, and we give this time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Continue our worship and a song this morning.
you never let go of me. Yes, I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will pray. Never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Oh no, you never let go through. that you do not, you do not ever let go of us, that you stand beside us in the fire through every storm, Lord. We're very thankful that you continue to mold us and shape us and refine us, Lord, to make this pure, pure gold, Lord. And we, we're just so thankful that we can just look to you as that refiner's fire, Lord, to just keep changing us and bring us closer to you every day. Amen. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure. is 
is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your Ready to do your will. Please be seated. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may it be our prayer that we would let you refine us, that you, we would let you mold us, not into what we want to be, but into what you want us to be into something that would bring you honor and glory. Lord, I know we at times can fight that. But Lord, as we're here today to worship you, may we truly just surrender all. May we let you mold us. Do it through your word. Lord, as Pastor Aaron comes forth in a few minutes and shares, Lord, we... We just ask you to open our ears, open our hearts and our minds to hearing and seeing you today. Use him to grow us closer to you. Lord, we are so blessed. We're so thankful for all that you do for us, Lord, and all that you provide and the fact that you're with us in good times and bad. And Lord, we just lift up to you right now the the Wilson family on the, the home going of Bill, Lord, and we thank you for such a godly man that just loved you and loved this church, one of those ones that would faithfully work behind the scenes doing so much and even to help build this structure that we get to use, Lord, to be a part of that and to be one of the leaders as an elder. Lord, we just thank you for the fact that we know he's with you. We know he's been restored. That he's in a, a great place because he's in your arms. So, Lord, we ask you to comfort the family this week and the weeks ahead. Lord, bless the service on Tuesday. That it would bring you honor and glory. And that you would be seen as we celebrate the blessing of Bill's life. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings of so many that work hard here at church. We thank you for being with the missions conference this past week. What a blessing to hear and see you at work, not just here locally, but around the world, and for us to be allowed to be a part of that. And Lord, we just thank you for all that work so hard to put that together. We ask you to bless the missionaries as they're probably... Some traveled home already, some on to other churches to speak, and we just ask you to bless them wherever they are. Lord, we thank you for those that work here locally with our junior church. Lord, we lift up to you that ministry. Lord, may it be a, a blessing to you and as well to the parents as they have a chance to come and, and, and sit here and, and listen intently to the service while we know their children are safely taken care of and hearing another message about you. So, Lord, we thank you for each one of those workers that you've brought forth. Lord, we just thank you that we're not the only ones that are serving you, Lord. I lift up to you so many of the churches in the county that will be meeting right now. 
Lord, we, we thank you for Green Pond Bible Chapel and their desire to serve you, Lord. We ask you to continue to bless them and their uh, outreach of their other church, the Highlands Church, Lord. We ask you to just fill both those churches with people hungry for you today. May they hear and see you through that message. Lord, we give back to you now just a small portion of what you've given us through our tithes and offering. May we give it with glad hearts as we give back to you what you so richly give to us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And it's your precious name I pray. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light it overwhelms the darkness there is a kingdom that forever reigns there is freedom from the chains that bind us jesus jesus who walks on the waters who speaks to the sea who stands in the fire beside me he roars like the lion he bled as the lamb he carries my healing in his hands Jesus there is a name I call in times of trouble. There is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. He is Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters. Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my Redeemer. There is power in your name. Walk on the waters, you speak. 
one like you, Jesus. There is no one like you. Amen. And thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn, for praying in my stead there. I was gargling, trying to get my voice back and lost track of the time there. Uh, at that and Bill Bird caught me and started talking college football and all, all time was off. I heard, I heard that final song and I thought, oh, I think I'm up next. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we continue to look at what it means to be the body of Christ. And Paul here is addressing a very interesting and specific and a very special part of what it means to be the body of Christ. And that is the Lord's Supper when we take communion together. Paul is going to be addressing some things that were going on in the church that dishonored the supper, dishonored the Lord and brought shame even to the church, he's going to tell us in a few moments. And this is a particularly important passage of scripture because the lord's supper or communion as we take it together is one of the most beautiful expressions of what it means to be the body of christ it's not only the fact that we as we take the lord's supper celebrate the fact that we commune or that's why we call it communion commune with god but that we commune with one another that there's a fellowship and a communion with our lord that we are celebrating and symbolizing but there's a also a communion and a fellowship with one another that is celebrated and symbolized when we take the lord's supper together and so paul here will be speaking of some extremely important issues not only to the church in corinth but the church to us i think the whole gist of this passage is wrapped up in verse 27 and many of us have heard this spoken about or talked about before we take the Lord's Supper, and it's verse 27 that says, So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. It goes on a little bit further as Paul is admonishing the Corinthians when he says in verse 29, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why, he says, many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. And that word fallen asleep, that little phrase is a euphemism for dying. And so what was going on in the early Corinthian church were there were, there, were those who were taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. God's judgment was on them, even to the point, Paul says, is why some of them were dying. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a bit of a scary phrase, isn't it? That opens my eyes. It at least tells me that God takes seriously what he's talking about in these next few verses. And he takes seriously what we do and how we take the Lord's Supper as the body of Christ. I can remember as a kid hearing this passage. And this was a passage that my pastor growing up would often talk about before we took the Lord's Supper. And he would always talk about there are a number who have even fallen asleep. And we all knew that that meant dying. And I can remember as a kid, as the plate and the, the juice and the bread were passed, having my eyes uh, closed, my head bowed, looking up just to see if anybody was going to kick the bucket during the Lord's Supper. This, when I was a little kid, it was a real concern. And uh, even after I became a believer at age nine, I remember taking this very, very seriously and really worrying and thinking, what does it mean to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? Well, what I want to do this week and next week is I want us to look at this passage and we're going to look and really answer the question, what does it mean to take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? And really, what does it look like to come together as the body of Christ, to worship and to celebrate Christ in a worthy manner? This morning, we're going to look simply at verses 17 through 22. And then next week, when we take the Lord's Supper together, we'll look at verses 23 to the end of the chapter. And so I want us to begin by looking at verses 17 through 22. And let's begin to answer the question, what does it mean to take the supper in a worthy manner? What is the Bible calling on us to do and be when we gather together for worship and acknowledge and celebrate the Lord's death on the cross and His resurrection. 
So I'll begin this morning. I want to read starting in verse 17 and I'll read through verse 22. The Bible says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be dif- there no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. So we see here that Paul is displeased not with the Lord's Supper, but with the attitudes and the actions that were accompanying the Lord's Supper. And certainly the problem with the Corinthians was not that they were failing to get together, but the failing was they were failing to be truly God's people when they gathered together. We see that there were divisions, especially along the line of class and socioeconomic uh, establishments within the church. There were those who had much that weren't sharing with those who had little. And in essence, they were failing to live up to what Paul will say in just a few verses in chapter 12, verse 13, when he says, For we are all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given one Spirit to drink. Paul's saying the way you're taking the Lord's Supper, church, is antithetical to the very meaning of the Lord's Supper, the very meaning of being the body of Christ. So as we start to unfold this passage, let's answer the question that is most pressing, and it's this. So what does it mean as a church to take the supper in a worthy manner? How do we do that? Well, first of all, Paul is telling us we take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner when we, number one, seek unity. When we are a people who seek unity. Again, in verses 18 through 19, Paul paints this picture of a church that was in the midst of division. And we know that from earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians. But now Paul is saying, not only are you divided over the leaders you're going to follow, not only are you divided in you know false teachers versus true teachers, he's saying even in the Lord's Supper, the ultimate expression of unity, you are divided. There are divisions among you. And we see Paul's single-minded focus because if you look at verse 18, he says something very interesting. He says, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. What's interesting, if you read the rest of this passage, there is no second place. Usually when somebody says, in the first place, there's this, and then they're going to say, in the second place, in the third place. If you read the rest of the passage, there is only one place, one point, One passion that Paul has here, he doesn't deviate from it. And it's this idea of instead of treating each other with brotherly love, acting as the family of God, when they gather together, especially when they take the Lord's Supper, there are divisions among them. Now, the division, and we'll we'll really unpack this a bit more in a, a couple of minutes, But the divisions in this church seem to be along the lines of the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor, those who had a little bit of a higher place in society and those who society says were in a lower place. And instead of the church being a transforming culture in and of itself, transformed by the gospel, they were allowing the culture to transform them. And this deeply grieved the heart of Paul because it deeply grieves the heart of God. Now, we're going to see in a minute exactly how this played out. But the bottom line was there were divisions. Now, Paul makes an interesting statement. Did you catch that in verse 19? Look at what Paul says in verse 19. He says, No doubt there have to be differences among you 
to show which of you have God's approval. So we know biblically the Bible says that God does not want there to be disunity and division within the body of Christ. But Paul is acknowledging that the body of Christ, the church, is made up of broken and sinful people. And inevitably, there are going to be differences among us. Paul says that these are necessary, that they must be, that it's just a reality. But what is interesting, what is ultimately the end point of differences within the body of Christ? Paul says it's to ascertain who among you has God's approval. The bottom line is differences exist so that important matters can be discussed, so that different viewpoints can be brought to light, and ultimately to find out who is right, what is right, what the correct thing is. In other words, the inevitable differences are to shed light on a situation and ultimately bring unity of thought and practice. The division that doesn't honor God is when we have differences, but they ultimately result in schisms and tearing and a lack of fellowship and more darkness instead of more light. Paul's just basically saying this. Even in the church, even though we're all filled with the Holy Spirit, we have differences on things. Somebody's got to be right. Somebody's got to be wrong. We need to go through a Christ-like, God-honoring process to figure out who's right and who's wrong. And when we figure out who's right, we should have unity and light among the truth and what is right. And so Paul is basically saying, don't let differences divide you. Instead, let them illuminate you and ultimately bring you together. So the question would be then, if we approach the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner by seeking unity, the most obvious question would be then, how do we seek that unity? If we're seeking it, how do we come to that point? And Paul next outlines what I think are two fundamental ways that we can take the supper in a worthy manner, come together and worship in a worthy manner, and ultimately seek unity. And that's found in verses 20 through 22. So number one, Paul's saying seek unity. How do we do that? Well, number two, we do that by, first and foremost, seeking the good of others. Seek the good of others. Look at verses 20 through 22 here. This is a messed up church. And this is one messed up worship service that he's talking about. Verse 20, So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. In other words, he's saying, you may think you're taking communion, you may, be th- you may think you're taking the Lord's Supper, but this is not the Lord's Supper the way you are doing it. This is the way they were doing it. For when you are eating, verse 21, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. <clears throat> so this is what was going on in the early church. This was happening in Corinth. And it was a practice that most of the early churches adopted. And that was when they gathered together before they would take communion or the Lord's Supper, they would have what was called the love feast. And the love feast was simply nothing more than a potluck dinner. People would bring in the food. They would eat together as a church family. It was called a love feast because it was supposed to be an expression of love and care for one another, for for the body of Christ. And so in the best sense, they would come together, they would eat, they would bring enough food so the poor folks could have a good meal, the rich folks wouldn't go sit by themselves, they would intermingle as the body of Christ, and it would be a beautiful picture of fellowship. But what was happening in the Corinthian church was this. Obviously, the rich folks were coming with a lot of food. And not only were they not sharing with the poor folks, but there's evidence here that they were actually going and eating by themselves. They were kind of sequestering themselves from the poor people in the church. Instead of transforming the culture around them, 
in essence, the culture was transforming the church because in the Greco-Roman culture at that time, there was a very strict class system. So out in the world, the world called you what you were and defined you by your class. And it was very hard if you were a poor person to move out of that class. If you were a Gentile or a Jew, or if you were a slave, or if you were a freeman, if you were a, you know, a, a wealthy ruling class in the Greco-Roman society, or if you were a poor peasant working class, there were deep divisions. You were defined and identified by what you were according to the class structure, and you never really got to move from one class to another. The whole point of the church was to transform that where Paul said, in Christ there are neither poor nor rich, there are neither, neither Greek nor uh, Jew, there's neither barbarian or, or you know, rich or poor, man or woman. Throughout the scriptures, it's a picture of a culture transformed by the gospel. But in this Corinthian church, the rich were doing their own thing, Likely they were inviting important guests to sit at their table or their section of the church or the home where they were gathered. They had the better food, the more food. The poor folks came. They had very little. And even on top of that, the rich folks not only were not sharing, but they were eat, actually eating and drinking to, the, to such excess that they were getting drunk. And then when all of that was over, the pastor would say, let's take the communion, the Lord's Supper together. And Paul is saying it's an absolute joke. He says it's a shame. You are despising the church of God. This just highlights the, the priority that God puts on the body of Christ caring for one another. The Christian virtue of doing good to others, sacrificing what we have for the good of others. That is a biblical New Testament principle, and it's been a guiding, defining principle for the church for 2,000 years. That's why the church is the entity that has established hospitals and universities that have cared for the poor and the widows and the sick and the affirmed. Because this call to care for the other and to look out for the good of the other is one of the most basic Christian callings. But instead, the Corinthians were putting their own needs first. The rich Corinthians were putting their wealth on display. They were putting their own desire for social standing above being the body of Christ. Now, as I was looking at this passage this week, I always ask of the passage, okay, so what is the application for Lafayette Federated Church? What is the application for, for us as a church? And I will tell you, this is uh, one of the, the most encouraging things about being a part of this body of Christ. Because my encouragement, our application is this church, we do this well. Let's keep it up. I will have to say, one of the hallmarks of this body of believers, and one of the reasons that I'm most grateful and thankful for being a part of this body of Christ called Lafayette Federated Church, is that we care for each other. That has been one of the hallmarks of this church for decades, if not longer, in this community. It's a hallmark and something that we're known for, Many of you, myself included, have been on the receiving end of humble, quiet, gracious care for one another. There is hardly a week that goes by that I don't hear about someone financially or physically or materially blessing someone in this congregation in need. And guess what? Most of the time it's done privately and quietly and anonymously. One of the great blessings of this church is we take serious this call to care for one another. And not only do we do this as a church individually, but we can be thankful that we also do that well 
organizationally and intentionally with our programs and ministries. It is incredible and such a blessing to see people who lose a loved one be ministered to by various people in various ways, from a refrigerator full of food to a, a call a couple of weeks later to our grief ministry that intentionally links people weeks and even months after the death of a loved one to someone who cares and listens. It's incredible to see uh, the social action committee, which I think is one of the one of the most effective ministries of any church that I've been in or that I've heard of in meeting the physical, financial, and practical needs of people in this church and in this community. It's incredible. Uh, through our social action committee, through uh, what you give and what you buy and what other people buy at the Sunshine Shop, through donations of food, donations that we take up at the end of the Lord's Supper service every first Sunday. We take up an offering. All of this money goes to helping church members and people outside the church with food, with uh, <clears throat> light bills. Um, it goes toward helping people, training people to how to do something as simple as a budget, how to cook in a way that's budget friendly. We have people in this church, specifically in the social action committee, that will help people with basic life skills. The, the good thing is that very rarely does anyone fall through the cracks, either through the individual care for one another or the programs and ministries like social action, our seniors ministry, our grief ministry. Um, it's just an incredible, beautiful thing that we have going on here at Lafayette Federated Church. Now, do we do it perfectly? No. I do know occasionally people fall through the cracks. That's one of the reasons why I'm most excited about the beginning of the deacon ministry. The beginning of the deacon ministry was really out of a motivation that we do everything that we can so that people don't fall through the cracks, so that we can very intentionally meet needs and care for one another. So what is the application, church? I would say with great joy, it is to keep doing what you're doing. To always be looking, always be seeking, always be paying attention to one another, be sensitive to what's going on in each other's lives, invest in each other enough so that when you know a brother or sister is hurting or in need or struggling financially or spiritually or physically, that not only do you know about it, but you're equipped to help meet that need. And so I would just say, let's continue to be ever vigilant. Let's continue to do what the Lord has just built into the DNA of this church. Let's never less rest on our laurels. Let's never think we have it fully figured out. Let's always be looking, but let's also just continue to do what God has, has put in our hearts to care for each other and to love one another. So how do we, how do we seek unity? How do we worship and gather and take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? Well, number one, it's seeking unity. How do we seek that unity? Number two, by seeking the good of others above our own good. And then finally, we see this. And this is one of the most telling little passages, verses in this passage. It's found at the end of verse 22. And it's a very real concern of Paul. It's a very real concern of the early church and of the Bible of Jesus himself. And that is this. Not only do we seek the good of others, but as the body of Christ, we seek equality in Christ. We seek to treat each other with equality in Christ. Look again at verse 22. He says, Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God? And look at this little phrase. By humiliating those who have nothing. So what Paul is addressing here <coughs> is not only his concern that the church wasn't meeting each other's needs, they weren't sharing the meal, but it's going a step further and saying, by not caring for each other because of class divisions, you are humiliating each other. In other words, he's saying you are, by the the fact that you are treating each other differently because you are in a different class or because you have more money or for any other reason, 
He says, not only are you not meeting a need, but you are totally forgetting the equality that we have in Christ. You are humiliating those who have nothing. And that idea of humiliating is degrading them. Or, in other words, in the original language, putting them in a lower place. They were humiliating him, humiliating them. The basic sense of what was going on was in this church, there was blatant classism that was going on. And the church, the Bible teaches us, should be the one place, if nowhere else, should be the one place where the rich and the poor come together, love each other in the equality they have in Christ. That the church must be the one place that no matter what your race is, that we come together in the equality that we have in Christ. It's the one place that no matter who you are, that because you are in Christ, we are one, the one body, the one baptism, part of the one faith. This was something that Jesus was passionate about. This was something that the early church and the apostles were passionate about. This is something that Paul is passionate about. We even see at the very beginning of the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 that they were so passionate about this sense of equality in Christ and caring for each other that the pattern in the new church, if you in the in the church in uh, in the early part of of its creation was the fact that they came and they shared all that they had. People were bringing everything to a community pot so that everybody could have what they needed. This was how passionate the early church was about this idea of caring for each other and caring for each other no matter class, no matter race, no matter background, no matter where you came from in society. This was a passion of Paul's. It was a passion of the Lord's. It was the passion of the early apostles. This was in stark contrast to the Greco-Roman culture of the time. That culture doggedly promoted this almost unbreakable class system. And I think that's why Paul is so passionate and so angry with the church. Because the gospel had literally broken down these walls. The walls of rich and poor. The gospel had broken down the walls of free or slave. The gospel had broken down the walls of men and women. The gospel had broken down the walls of of all of the things that divide us. And all of a sudden, at what should be the highlight of unity, the Lord's Supper, they were building the walls that the gospel had broken down. I want to read to you Ephesians 2, 11 through 20. This was written quite a while before Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians. And let's be reminded of the incredible power that the gospel has to break down walls and divisions and classism, racism, and any other ism that divides us. Listen to what Paul had written sometime earlier to the church in Ephesus. He said, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But, he says, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose, this is God's purpose, His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, 
thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. He's reminding us if we want to take the supper in a worthy manner, if we want to worship God in a way that honors Him, if, if we want to be the body of Christ in a way that honors Him, we must seek unity by certainly seeking the good of others and then by seeking that we treat each other with the equality that we have in Christ. Can I tell you when a church does that? The, the transforming work that God can do through them is almost limitless. But when a church is bound by a lack of care for one another, when a church is bound by classism or racism or just bound by not seeing each other as equal in Christ, then you have a body that is just dead that so often God just chooses not to use. The first church that I pastored at in Louisville, Kentucky, was a church that um, I came to pastor after a very difficult time. The pastor left under very difficult circumstances. The church was hurting. And there was a, a whole group of people in that church, not large, not the majority, but a significant group of people who were hurting, a significant group of people who by their nature were dividers, were those who loved to cause strife, and they were a group of people, quite frankly, who rejected the uh, concept of reaching out to the community around us, which happened to be on the low end of the socioeconomic uh, rung of things. There were a lot of poor folks and, and a, lot of, a lot of people of a lot of different races around us, and we were a predominantly white church. It was really interesting. The first year and a half at the church just... <laughs> It was tough. It was tough. I, I'm not making this up. I had a full head of hair until I started pastoring that church. <coughs> and, and you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. <coughs> I began losing my hair. These folks were that difficult, this small group of people. It was characterized by two things that I saw happen. One was at a church picnic, and it's kind of interesting because it almost parallels what was going on in the book of 1 Corinthians. There were a group who uh, really loved the former pastor, had hung on. They were, they were really difficult people. They were really difficult people. And therefore, anything that I planned or kind of championed or anyone who was associated with me, they would often snub them, make life very difficult for them. I remember one church picnic. It was on the 4th of July. It was crazy to have it on 4th of July because it was like 102 degrees. Very few people showed up. And at the end of the of the picnic, we had like, it was 60 or 70 hot dogs left over because no one was there because it was 120 degrees. A fella and his wife, an older guy that I had had the privilege, Dana and I had had the privilege of leading him and his wife to the Lord. They were there. He was rough. He was a rough guy. Um, good guy. Loved the Lord, but he was rough. He had probably spent more time in prison, literally, up to that point in his 55-year-old life than he had spent out of prison. He was a rough guy. But he'd come to know Christ, man. The Lord was working on him. But he was, he was rough around the edges. Um, so rough, he coached our, uh, one of our t-ball, little kids' t-ball teams. And in one season, I had to tell him that he couldn't uh, coach with the cigar in his mouth, that when he got upset, he really shouldn't curse at the children or at the parents. I mean, this guy was rough. But he was a work in progress, and, and he loved the Lord. It was at the end of this picnic, and they struggled financially, that Jim came up and said, Hey, Aaron, do you think it'd be okay if I got four or five hot dogs and took them home for dinner tonight? I was like, Oh, absolutely. I said, They're just sitting there. He went to go get the hot dogs, and one of the leaders of this difficult group looked at him and said, What do you think you're doing? So oh, I'm, I'm getting a few hot dogs. Pastor Aaron said I could get them. And she said, Those hot dogs are not for you. 
Who do you think you are just coming up and taking the food? And I kind of heard that and I was trying to figure out what I do to be Christ-like because it generally doesn't go over good to punch someone in the nose uh, at a church picnic. So I didn't say anything. Jim came back. I said, he said, I don't worry about it. And I said, I'm so sorry. He said, I don't worry about it. You know, five minutes later, this woman and her family <laughs> were bagging up the hot dogs to take home. So that was the nature of those folks. You know what happened eventually? Thank the Lord. This entire group of people, I think I just waited them out. Uh, lost my hair and waited them out. And this entire group of people left the church. Now, do you realize, really, honestly, you can, there is addition by subtraction in church equations. And sometimes it is a very good thing for people to leave a church. These folks were nasty and divisive. They left the church. It was just about that time that we had invited a group of Haitian Christians to come and use our building um, for their church services. And the longer they were there, the more things we started to do together. And I'll never forget, um, it was just about the time these difficult people left that we, if I remember correctly, this has been many years ago, we decided to meet somewhere other than the sanctuary so that they could have some big event. They usually either met in the sanctuary after our service was over or they met in the fellowship hall. But for some reason, it was best that they met, meet in the sanctuary. So I, we were like, oh, yeah, let us meet in the fellowship hall. You guys have the sanctuary. It was after that that a group, not the original group, but another group of fringe members who uh, weren't happy that the Haitians were there that approached me in the hall one time right after that, and they said, Pastor, when are we going to uh, stop catering to these black people? I took a little bit of pastoral privilege at that moment, and I said what I had to say, and then I told them, you are not welcome in this church. You need to leave. You're not welcome here anymore. And they ended up leaving. Now, can I tell you what God did almost uh, synonymously with both one difficult division-oriented people and one group of racist people? Uh, when they left the church, you know what God almost began doing immediately? God began to develop in this church one of the sweetest spirits of unity, of love. The Haitian church began to grow so much that they had to leave our building because they couldn't fit in our building, and they had to go buy another building. We had this incredible relationship with this other group of believers. The, the folks that were left, there, there was a sense of unity and purpose and determination. We started reaching. We didn't set the world on fire. You didn't read about us in Church Growth Magazine. But we started effectively reaching the community. We started being able to not only reach out to, but bring in and love the, the folks who, quite frankly, were in the lowest socioeconomic um, bracket in all of the city that were right around our church. We started ministering to them. And there was for six or seven years, one of the sweetest uh, experiences of fellowship, of unity, of one mindedness and of God working that I've ever experienced. And I'm convinced it was obviously God at work, but it was when the church finally decided to deal with, to get rid of, to allow to leave people who were doing just what these Corinthians were doing, practicing uh, classism, practicing racism, having no concern for the good of others. And once those folks were gone, it was just like the Holy Spirit took over. And what a sweet place. I cried like a baby when we had to leave that church and move to Missouri because we loved those folks so much. It was such a, a blessing. My point is this, that God honors a church and a people who intentionally and doggedly seek unity by seeking the good of each other and by breaking down walls of classism, racism, and any other ism that denies the truth that in Christ we are all equal. That God honors a church 
that does that and is intentional about that. And so as I wrap up, the application, the word of encouragement to us, church, is this. Let's keep it up. Let's never rest on our laurels. Let's always be intentional. Let's look for ways that we can better and more effectively and more intentionally meet each other's need. Let's look for ways that we can more intentionally and more effectively reach out to people who are different than us. Because there is something beautiful about a local body of believers that reflects the greater body of Christ across this world with different colors and languages and races and backgrounds. There's something beautiful about a diverse local body of Christ. And our encouragement is, let's just continue on. Let's be more intentional. Let's never uh, rest on our laurels. Let's look for ways that we can be the body of Christ in these areas in every way. And this is why I think God mostly honors and blesses a church that will take this seriously. Because when we seek the good of others, when we seek equality in Christ, when we seek unity, that is when we best reflect the gospel. Because the message of the gospel, the entirety of the Christian faith, the core message, what we celebrate next week when we take the Lord's Supper is this great truth that in Christ and in Christ alone, We have, through the cross, unity, not only with our Father through our sins being forgiven, but we have unity with one another. The gospel tells us that not only do we have unity with one another, but we meet each other's greatest needs because in Christ, through His death on the cross and resurrection, He met our greatest need. And that was to be saved, and that was to be forgiven That was to be reconciled. And so when we meet each other's needs, we are are reflecting the, the gospel meeting our ultimate need. And that when we treat each other with equality and seek to celebrate equality within the diversity of the body of Christ, we reflect the gospel in the great truth that As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.11, that the cross is that which breaks down the walls that divide us. That in Christ we are one body. As Paul said in Ephesians, that his purpose was to create one humanity out of two. And so when we practice this intentionally, oh my goodness, we reflect and we communicate and we preach the gospel in a powerful way. Because if there has ever been a time in our culture that we are more divided among political and even still racial and and socioeconomic lines. It's our culture today. And our challenge is this. Will we be a transforming agent in the culture because we've been transformed within these walls? Or will we be transformed by the culture? Let's keep it up. Let's continue to be a transforming picture of the gospel for those around us. Finally, as we close this morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, can I tell you, this great God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to break down the wall that divides you from God. And that wall is your sin. And the Bible says that Jesus on the cross took the penalty and the price for your sin He paid the price for your sin so that you can have salvation and forgiveness. And that salvation and forgiveness comes through receiving Christ by faith, by repenting from your sin, committing your life to Jesus, and He will break down every barrier, not only between you and and Him, but He will begin to bring reconciliation and healing in your relationships uh, here on earth. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, at the end of this service, we invite you, you come forward. We'd love to spend some time visiting with you. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. And church, let's continue to be a source of reconciliation and hope and good unity in this church so that God would be honored and that the gospel would be communicated. Father, we pray and we ask that you would indeed help us to be one people with one purpose 
underneath the, the one cross, the one hope that we have in you, Jesus. Lord, I praise you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that you've allowed me, my family, allowed us to be a part of a body that does that well. Help us, though, to do it even better. Help us to be even more intentional. Father, I, I pray that uh, this church would continue to be a beacon, a beacon of the gospel in these areas in particular, in this community and beyond. Lord, guide us, sustain us, and use us. And Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The year was 1975, and Brian Leach was sitting in his study, staring into his roaring fire in his fireplace, contemplating a, a Bible study, a series of Bible studies that he and his friends had done. And he was contemplating not just the Bible studies, but he was contemplating the challenge that one of his friends had given him to him. The Bible studies were on the very thing the pastor shared with us today, the body of Christ and its impact in, 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 in the world and how the world can either transform it or it can transform the world. The challenge was his friend said, you know, there's not too much in our hymnals and in our contemporary Christian music that talks about being the body of Christ, living it, loving one another, and being that example of the world. We need a, a song that says that. As he watched and was thinking, an ember flew out of the fireplace and landed right in the front of the fireplace, and it glowed for a minute, and then it died. And he immediately started writing. It was funny because he was listening to classical music in the background, and when he started writing this contemporary song in 1975, it was put to music by Brahms. But the words really are a call to us. Are we going to be God's people? The hymn is number 283, We Are God's People. Would you stand and let's declare this intent together that this is what we will continue to do. We are God's people, the chosen of the Lord, born of his spirit, established by his our cornerstone is Christ alone, and strong in him we stand. Oh, let us live transparently, and walk hard to heart and hand in hand. We are God's loved ones, the bride of Christ the light 
and to inspire. Well, we pray that we will be that, that flame, that ember, that uh, hope, and that picture of Christ in our community. Before we go, I just got word that today is John Court's birthday. He told me 29th birthday, so happy birthday, man. And I hope you have a good day, so I wanted to say happy birthday. How many times have you been 29? A few, a few. <laughs> happy birthday, man. Happy birthday. Well, let's pray, and uh, let's go in God's peace and grace this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for... Uh, the privilege of being the body of Christ, and we pray that we would reflect that, uh, Lord, in everything that we do. And Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to uh, care for each other, and Lord, to be even more intentional about reaching those outside these walls who might be quite different from us. Lord, may we not only reach them, but love them, accept them, and lead them uh, to a knowledge of you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this church. Lord, what a joy it is to be a, a part of this local body of believers. We praise you and ask that you would use us in uh, many ways, in ways that glorify and honor you. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.